Bob did not have the discipline to be a real good coach. Yeah, they'd be drawing plays up in the dirt. You know, I don't think they, they don't think they had a playbook at all. Bob would just sort of wing it down the sideline. And you look at coaches like Vince Lombardi and uh, Hank Stram and the coaches that year, they were very successful. John Shula, they were very structured, disciplined people. Bob was not. After the season was over, he went back to the ranch. He just he showed up for practice. He showed up for games, and that was about it. He wasn't there uh, looking at film till three in the morning like some of these coaches are. He uh, he wasn't all excited about being a coach, and he told me when he interviewed, he said, "I don't know why." And I let him talk me into going to New York. I didn't want to go to New York. I didn't like New York. I didn't like the polo ground. But you know, basically, Wismer was very persuasive, offered him a lot of money, and he accepted. And he he regretted it. He was as happy to get out of uh, New York as Wismer was to get him out of New York. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hey, everybody, it's Tim Hanlon. How are you? Thank you for joining me here on Good Seats Still Available. As you know by now, the curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. Thank you for uh, for joining us on our little uh, excursion into uh, sports and leagues and teams that don't exist anymore and the reasons why, etc. Uh, today, we are uh, turning our sights back to uh, the 1960s American Football League, the fourth iteration of the AFL, uh, and uh, one particular team uh, that was part of its inception, uh, the New York franchise called the Titans. The Titans of New York was their official title, and uh, they ran from 1960 to 1963 or so. Uh, Until, of course, they became, with new ownership and uh, a whole new outlook on life, today's New York Jets. We are uh, uh, honored to be uh, chatting with uh, the author of the book about the Titans. I think the only real book that's out there about them. uh, It's called Crash of the Titans, the team that became the New York Jets. And his name is Bill Rizek. And uh, we uh, had a great conversation and some really interesting tidbits about life in the pre-New York Jets, that is New York Titans world and uh, some really interesting stories and uh, and recollections. And again, if you call yourself a New York Jets fan, uh, you owe it to yourself to listen to this show. And frankly, our third episode uh, with um, our, our pal Michael McCambridge, uh, where we talk about uh, the, uh, the AFL in general and Lamar Hunt, obviously the uh, patron saint of the AFL. I highly encourage you to either before listening to this episode uh, or maybe shortly thereafter listening to this episode that you... Uh, Hop on over to our website, goodseatsstillavailable.com, or, or go to iTunes or whatever and find that episode. I think it's episode number three. Uh, and uh, supplement your listening today with uh, that episode with Michael McCambridge, which I highly recommend. But our conversation with Bill Rizek about the Titans of New York uh, in just a couple of seconds uh, here on the big show. Uh, I want to remind you, of course, that we are again sponsored by our friends at Audible, which you know is the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles. Uh, in just about every genre known to man and woman. Uh, And uh, that uh, all those titles, they play on just about every device you can throw at them. Um, Audible is just the most awesome service if you uh, want to enjoy a literary work or two or hundreds or thousands uh, without necessarily having to read, but perhaps listen to. Uh, And if uh, you would like a free trial of the Audible service, uh, you've heard me say this before, and if you haven't done it, shame on you. Uh, you can go to audibletrial.com slash good seats, our little web pointer, and uh, and try it out for yourself. You'll get a free month's uh, subscription to the Audible service, and you will also get a free audiobook download, yours to try and uh, and enjoy. And uh, you can cancel at any time. Uh, it's really a good uh, opportunity to see, know better, hear for yourself uh, the beauty of an audiobook uh, as provided to and delivered to you by Audible. That's audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free audiobook download and free 30-day trial. Again, you can cancel at any time. I highly encourage you do so. And of course, when you do give it a try, you're also helping out the show, uh, which we also appreciate too. Okay, that's the promotional stuff. We got that out of the way. Uh, let's move on now to our great chat, our fun chat uh, with Bill Rizek here on The Big Show. As you probably know, this uh, this show, we're about uh, 20 or so episodes into it. And um, uh, who knows why we do this? I, I think it's because of my uh, fandom as a kid uh, watching the New York Cosmos back in the uh, 70s and early 80s at Giant Stadium uh, and the uh, fascination with teams and leagues that uh, came and went in that league, the NASL and, and others to follow. 
Um, but having grown up in the New York area, right, obviously being a Jets fan or more a Giants fan, but let's be honest, Jets were certainly part of the consciousness. Um, you know, there is this team that uh, preceded it. And um, I guess maybe the first real question I'd have is is to get some sense of uh, how you stumbled into the story of the Jets before they were the Jets. Uh, and then what convinced you maybe to do a book about it? I read an article in Sports Illustrated in the fall of 1969. I remember it very well. I was playing high school soccer at the time. We had a very cold game. It turned out I was getting the flu. Uh, went home, went to bed, was reading Sports Illustrated. And there was a story um, by Alex Kroll, who had uh, played offensive line for the Titans and was a very erudite individual. Went on to become the CEO of uh, Young and Rubicam Advertising Agency. Did quite well for himself. He wrote an article about the Titans, and it was written from a humorous point of view, talking about all the tribulations of the team. And that first got me interested, and it sort of stuck with me. And I, like you, like to look at things that didn't work very well. It's always more interesting. I wrote, I wrote a book on the National Association, which was the first uh, major league, first sports major league. It was a baseball team from 18, baseball league from 1871 to 75. And and it was filled with failure and snafus. And as I wrote in the introduction, and like I said, accounting is not a popular spectator sport. Efficiency is not entertaining. Uh, failure is much more entertaining. Finding out what happened, why it went wrong, who was involved. There's usually some characters in, who were involved. In the case of the Titans, there were a lot of characters involved. Number one among them being Harry Wismer, the owner. Well, sure. Um, and uh, so, but what convinced you to write a book about it, though? Because uh, it's, uh, you're, you're not an author full time by trade, right? Well, I, I always liked writing. Uh, I, I like writing. I like history. And I like sports. And the combination got me writing sports books. When I was uh, oh, in my mid-20s, I started look, looking at the National Association, which is the baseball league. Said, so, yeah, when I retire, I think I'll write a book about this. It was, a, it was the first professional sports league. No one had ever written about it. And I think I will do that when I retire. And then in 1981, I wound up having some major surgery. I was going to be home for six weeks. And I got at the baseball encyclopedia. And I thought I was writing about the beginnings of baseball and I would move forward. Uh, and people asked if I had a plan in my history. And I said, I did. But I executed it 40 years ahead of schedule and backwards. So I did have a plan, so I wound up actually going back because I thought that was not the start. And that was, that's what got me writing books. I've done seven books, two on football, five on baseball, and do it nights and weekends, which is good because it's very hard to make a living writing books about things like the New York Titans. Uh, when I interview people, some of the ex-players, they uh, or more so, I finished a book on minor league football in Connecticut, which came out in 2014, which is even more obscure. And they interview people and they say, oh, you're in the finance business. And I would say, uh, believe it or not, you can't make a living writing book about the Hart books about the Hartford Charter Ropes. And the same thing about the Titans. Uh, I, I like to do write part time. I have a full time job where I earn, earn a living and I can write about things I like to write about because the Titans are not. And, and you write about things that no one else has written about. They're not hugely marketable. Uh, there's a guy named Dennis Tuttle who did a biography of Sammy Ball. And Dennis is a full-time writer, and he's a good writer. And he had contacted me after the Titans book came out, and he said it had only been his idea to do a book on the Titans. And he said, I went to the bookstore, saw your book, and I damn near got sick. Uh, when I know how that feels. You've got an idea, and you go in and find out that somebody else has done it. Uh, that's what, So the Titans, that Alice Kroll article got me going. I like writing about the start of things, how they got started, things that are somewhat spectacular failures, and things that no one else has written about before. Uh, I wrote, wrote about the Yankees and Mets in the 1960s. And a lot of people have written about that. But they wrote about Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris and Casey Stengel. And I wrote about other things uh, because I just don't want to write the same book that somebody else has written. And uh, and certainly I don't think anyone since then has written about the Titans. Well, I think that's great. So you say 69 and, and, and this article in SI. Um, were you a Jets fan at the time or was it just a story that just that 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 hooked you uh, besides your fandom of whatever team you were following? The story hooked me. I, like you, I'm a, I'm a Giants fan. I go back to the days of Y.A. Tittle and then the many dark years of the Giants. But I think anyone who was in the area followed the Jets to the Super Bowl when they had Joe Namath. Uh, the Jets were my second team, and I always always liked them. Uh, the Patriots were in the area, but 
The Patriots weren't really an exciting team back in the late 60s. They had Mike Tolliver at quarterback and Tom Sherman. And actually, I got to know Tom Sherman. He played minor league football and I interviewed him. He's a wonderful man. He's a very smart man. But he wasn't Joe Namath. Uh, the Jets really uh, you know, got captivated in New York. And I just finished a book on it. It's coming out soon. The proof should be by any day called uh, Baseball on the Brink, the Crisis of 1968. And talking about how baseball had so many problems. And football was always uh, brought up as being the sport of the young because of dynamic young figures like Joe Namath. And But you go beyond Joe Namath, and I'm hard-pressed to see anybody in the pro football, uh, NFL or AFL, who was really appealed to the young. Certainly not Johnny Unitas, Gail Sayers, Leroy Kelly, Dick Butkus. I mean, they weren't youthful. They didn't have long hair. Namath was the only one. And if you were in the New York area at that time, yeah, you had to be. Uh, either he loved Namath or you hated him, but everybody knew Joe Namath. When they went to the Super Bowl, uh, certainly I was rooting for him. Didn't think they'd win, but I was rooting for him. Well, okay, so obviously quite the sensation. So so when you started this project then, what did you learn about the origins of the Titans? Obviously, it's it's intertwined with the, uh, with the founding of the AFL. We had um, Michael McCambridge on a few episodes ago, and he gave us uh, – quite a good bit of a rich history of, of Lamar Hunt and uh, obviously his uh, motivations and, and inclinations towards uh, starting a league, which obviously really began as more of a pursuit of an NFL franchise. And we've heard and seen this theme over and over again as we've gone back in time on other episodes. The NFL isn't necessarily uh, the most welcoming club to outsiders. Um, how, how did uh, how did you find the, the story beginning with regards to the, the AFL and how New York got a franchise? Well, Wisner was not in the initial group. And as you probably t- uh, learned, um, Hunt was negotiating with Walter Wolfner, the owner of the Chicago Cardinals, and he was taking a hard line and said, well, you're not the only one bidding. If you're not interested, I've got Mr. X, Mr. Y, Mr. Z, and Mr. A, and Mr. B, who are interested also. And Hunt said, hmm, if all those people want football teams, maybe I can start my own league. Bud Adams was, was one of those. Uh, Wisner was a broadcaster, a well-known broadcaster, bombastic broadcaster. He often made up his own he was on the radio where you could sort of make up the action. He'd point out celebrities that supposedly were there and weren't. He'd does uh, out oh, President Eisenhower there in the front row, almost caught that foul ball when Eisenhower wasn't anywhere near the ballpark. <laughs> and there's Elizabeth Taylor wearing a beautiful blue dress. And, and he just made up all these things. And he desperately, he craved attention. He was an alcoholic. And when he drank, he became manic. He became strange. He could be violent, uh, but he desperately wanted attention. He had a little money. He had been an owner of the uh, Washington Redskins. He'd owned part of the Lions at one time. And he had just about enough money to <laughs> to start the Titans. He was introduced to the group by, by Bill Shea. Bill Shea, from whom Shea Stadium was named. Shea was trying to get uh, Major League Baseball back to New York at that time, to the Continental League. And he knew Wismer. Uh, he introduced Hunt and Wismer. They went out to lunch and... Um, Hunt said, uh, yeah, he's interested in bringing a team to New York because being a football league, you want to be in New York. You want to have a team there. So many of the teams that have fa- or leagues that have failed missed out on the major cities. So they had a team on a team in New York. They wanted a team in, in Dallas. They they had a team in Boston. So they got Billy Sullivan up there. Billy was one of the later ones. They had a team in Los Angeles, of course. And, and Wismer desperately wanted a football team. He had a lot more ambition than he had money which wound up uh, hurting him. You look at the owners that succeeded, Hunt, Adams, Baron Hilton. They had plenty of money. They could afford to lose money. The owners like Sullivan didn't have a lot of money, and Wismer certainly did not have enough money. But he he was introduced by Bill Shea and wound up being part of the New York franchise. Wismer's biggest contribution was his connections in television. He was a broadcaster, and he was very instrumental in getting the contract with ABC, which was another must for any sports league trying to start up. When you look at the uh, football minor leagues, because uh, I, I looked at the Continental League when I was writing about minor league football, they wanted to be a major league. Happy Chandler was their commissioner, but they couldn't get a television contract. They got subscription TV, which was the precursor to cable TV, but they could never get a national contract. And that national contract is what saved the AFL. If they hadn't had the contract, they probably wouldn't have made it. Well, the it, was very it, poor in it, 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 Yeah, it was also, though, Wismer's brainchild, though, to... Uh, divvy up that television contract equally across all of the, the members of the league, right? That was at a first of its of its kind as well, right? Exactly. That was being in the New York market, 
it was probably to his detriment to divvy it up because Denver was not going to have as big a television market as New York. And divvying it up helped everybody. And later on, it wasn't a year or two later when Peter Ozell copied him and did the same thing, which is probably the biggest uh, testimony to, to Wismer's uh, foresight in, in divvying that all up. And that, that's what made them. Uh, it, maybe he would have survived if he took the lion's share to the New York market. Uh, maybe not. Uh, I think Harry would have self-destructed at some point anyway, regardless of how much money he had coming in. Can you give us any background on, on I know this is sort of a, a bit of a tangent to the story, but but, but the, the, the role of Bill Shea, because obviously the Continental League was something that was uh, in his purview and, and a stadium uh, was a new stadium in Flushing was part of that mix. Um, I'm just curious as to sort of what what Shea, it, what was in Shea's head by introducing him to Wismer. I, I, I can't imagine that Shea would not have been connected to I don't know, somebody else perhaps wealthier. I mean, you're talking about New York City, which is arguably a pretty wealthy and financially connected town. Uh, of all people, Wismer, who, you know, uh, was a football and announcer guy, but not necessarily deep pocketed. I don't know. I, I really can't tell you why Shea approached Wismer. Wismer was the person who gave the impression of having a lot more money than he did. So Shea may have been, um, and Shea was also a baseball guy. He was really interested in, uh, bringing base with the Continental League interest and bringing a New York franchise. Uh, football was not his main interest. Maybe he didn't think about it a lot. I don't know what was in his mind. As I say, Wismer was very good at appearing to have much more money than he had. He married very well in 1962, and he was one of those guys who would go out, and, and I know people like that. You know, I'm in the finance business, so I you know, probably have seen the net worth of some of the people we deal with. And you go out with them, you think they're a billionaire. They're chartering jets, they're ordering champagne, they're ordering the $300 bottles of wine, and you know they don't have it. But they give the impression that they do, and that may have been uh, what Shay thought. Boy, this guy's got a lot of money, because Wismer certainly tried to get the appearance of having a lot of money. And he hung around with um, John Roosevelt. He hung around with George Smathers. He was very well a senator from Florida. He was very well connected. So he certainly gave the impression of being a, a, a deal maker and a, a mover and a shaker. Why? Why do you think he wanted? Yeah, a, first, first Shea, a bit. Like, like, just you know, one more thing. Shea did much better uh, with the Mets when he hooked up with Joan Payson. That was the Whitney money was real money. <laughs> why, why do you think um, Wismer was so hell bent on on getting a uh, an AFL franchise, given his partial ownerships elsewhere in the NFL? You'd think he'd have more pull or potential there. Well, they. He didn't really like him. He had a dispute with uh, George Preston Marshall over his Redskin ownership. Uh, he'd had a problem in Detroit because he owned parts of two teams. He had a straw man. As you said earlier, the NFL was not a very welcoming society. A lot of people wanted to get to the NFL, and they couldn't. Uh, he certainly wasn't going to get in with the Maras in New York. New York was his territory where he wanted to be. Uh, the NFL was just very hard to get into. He, and I, I think if someone had offered him an NFL franchise, he would have taken it. Probably would have been his first choice, but he, no one offered. Yeah, and I hear that story over and over again, too. We talked about uh, a couple of weeks back about the uh, All-America Football Conference back in the 40s and certainly the AFL. Uh, so, and I, I would I suspect also the WFL and the USFL, which we're going to get to in, in future episodes. Uh, it, it, all it would have taken, frankly, for a lot of this uh, mayhem not to have happened would have been actually just to have gotten a franchise in the NFL. But so be it. We wouldn't have anything to talk about here on this podcast. Um, That's right. You, you, look, you look at any sports uh, franchise, you know, being hard-headed. I, I just getting the writing about Major League Baseball. You look at what the owners tried to do to the players in the 1960s. If they had been halfway conciliatory, they wouldn't have had Marvin Miller because there would have been no need for him. So many times you go back to baseball in the 19th century, which I've written about. You know, it's a hard line. Somebody wanted a National League franchise, they froze them out, they formed their own league happens has happened for 150 years yeah it's it's a it's a theme we're going to keep coming back to over and over again and i've seen it over uh, already so far um well all right so let's talk about how wismer gets this team sort of up and running obviously there was a a major signing and a coach and and obviously they had to find a place to play you want to speak on those two events in the early days well the only place to play was the polo ground uh he wasn't going to yankee stadium because the giants were there there wasn't really much else he was, his big hope was to get that new stadium in Queens, which was supposed to be coming in 62 and then 63. Uh, that was his salvation. You know, if, if he had to play in the polo grounds, he wasn't going to make it. The polo grounds had been sitting empty since 1957. 
when the Giants left town. And, and it was a mess. Uh, the press box was just decrepit. Uh, the seats were awful. And he didn't have a lot of money to put into it because he just had, but had enough money to buy uniforms and, you know, go to training camp. He wound up stiffing the people at training camp just about every year. Uh, he had a, he had three different training camps in three years because he ended up not paying people. Uh, the polo grounds was the only choice. It wouldn't have been anyone's first choice. It was a difficult place to play. The field was not in good shape. And again, he didn't have any money. When the Jets took over in 1963, they did a little. And of course, when the Mets came in in 62, they did a fairly major facelift on it. But it was a, a short, it was a stopgap uh, solution until that, until uh, Shea Stadium came along. And the, the other thing was signing players. Uh, the, the Jets, the Titans got a, a late start signing players. Uh, some of the teams really beefed up. Uh, the Titans did not. They did not have a great roster. As Sammy, Ball, <laughs> Sammy Ball once said, they ended up taking a lot of players that were cut by other teams. They said, it's difficult to beat other teams using players that weren't good enough to make those teams. And, and it was a, a hodgepodge of players, a lot of, uh, players that were in the, in a lot of the NFL players are rejects. He got some very good ones. Uh, he got Don Maynard. He got Art Powell, which were two of the best receivers in, in the AFL and, of course, Maynard's in the Hall of Fame. But he got them because there was something the NFL didn't like about them. Again, if you weren't the NFL's type, you weren't going to stay. Maynard was a maverick. Maynard went around in his cowboy boots and his sideburns and uh, his big cowboy hat. And he had a very unique personality, and the Giants thought he was strange. Uh, they cut him. Uh, Art Powell was a racial pioneer that wasn't very well looked upon in the, NF- in the NFL. He refused to stay in separate accommodations down south one time. He got cut by the Eagles. So they wanted picking up players that were not wanted somewhere else, and they lucked out sometimes. I mean, that, that, that's what with Maynard and, and Dor- or Maynard and uh, Powell, they really got lucky. They found players that just weren't going to be accepted by the NFL because of their personality, but who were outstanding players. You want to talk about Sammy Baugh because uh, Sammy Baugh, the first uh, coach hired, obviously was a pretty big name signing and, and arguably a uh, an attempt at making an immediate splash by Wismer, right? Uh, when you start writing things, you never know what you're going to find. And and one of the jewels that came out of this research project was Sammy Baugh. Uh, Sammy may be the greatest football player that ever lived. If you look at the things he could do, you know, Tom Brady was a better quarterback. Reggie Roby was probably a better punter. Uh, there are better defensive backs. But if you look at punting, quarterback, and defensive back, all of which Baugh played, and he was one of the best. He had the record for punting average for a long time. May still held that, I don't know. Uh, was the greatest quarterback and revolutionized the quarterback position. And also held the record for most interceptions in a game. I think he intercepted four in a game. Uh, won NFL championships. Probably the greatest put- football player that ever played in the NFL. And I, I tried to interview as many of the people connected with the Titans as I could. Got his phone number. And uh, called him up one night at home. And, you know, I'm not a famous writer, certainly. And, and he answered the phone. He said, I, I, I'm eating my supper. Can you call me back in half an hour? So I called him back in half an hour. And here's a guy he didn't know. He, we talked for, I don't know, 45 minutes or so. And he was fantastic. One of the most interesting people. And he was a very, very popular coach. He was not a great coach. But he was a very popular coach. He, he didn't have the discipline to be a great coach. He was a great offensive strategist. He he'd coached at Harden Simmons in here's this little college in Texas. They had the, the country's leading passer, I think, uh, two years when he was coaching there, which was really a phenomenal. He played LSU, which is one of the best teams in the country with Billy Cannon, the Heisman Trophy winner, and, and played them tight, almost beat him. He was a great strategist, and the players just loved him because he was a player's coach. And he was one of those guys, no nonsense, completely honest, knew the game, and they were in awe of him because of the player he had been. And, and hearing him talk, and he was just, you become friends with him in a, in, in a half an hour. you got to like the guy. He used profanity like most people use punctuation. He would just, you know, every other word was damn and hell. And that's just the way he spoke. It wasn't it to be foul mouth or mean. He would do that. He'd spit tobacco all the time. Uh, and he was just, the most, he was seven and seven both years which may have been quite an accomplishment with a team uh, like the Titans had. And he wouldn't put up with Harry Wismer. That's what finally got him. Uh, Wismer 
at the end of the second year, Bob had a three-year contract. And when he signed, Bob wanted the money in cash. Those were the days of cash. And he wanted, he had like, when they had the press conference, he had something like $20,000 in cash sitting in his pocket because he made Whisper pay him up front. But he had a three year contract and they wanted to get rid of him after two years. So they demoted him to kicking coach, figuring he'd quit and they wouldn't have to pay him. And he showed up. He showed up in camp and said, I'm, I'm here. Uh, you want me to teach kicking for 20000 a year? I'll do it. And after a few days, uh, Wismer relented, paid him the money. He always said he didn't get all the money. And uh, they had Bulldog turn to replace him. But Bob was a big name. Uh, Wismer treated him very poorly, as he treated everybody. Uh, he'd get drunk, and he'd go on a tirade. And, and Bob and those guys who just wouldn't take it, they got into a running battle in the press. By the second year, they were sniping at each other. And, and Bob was very witty. He had always had some comebacks. Uh, I said something about being a coach and how busy he was. He said, I'd rather be a ticket taker. That wouldn't keep me very busy because they didn't have very many people in the stand. You know, the old jokes, which uh, they've heard many times, is they would announce the crowd as like 20,000 when there were about 2,000 there. And they would say, and they brought, the uh, reporters would say, say things like 15,000 or 20,000 came disguised as empty seats or they were counting arms and legs. And Bill Wallace is reported from the New York Times told me the, the uh, Jets PR guy, or the Times PR guy, announced the crowd. He said, I have been told to announce there are 15,000 people here. Do with that do with that what you will. I've been told to announce there are 15,000 people here. Do with that what you will. And they were just always overstating it. And Bob, Bob told it like it is. And Wesner was trying to make a story and Bob didn't, co- Bob didn't cooperate. He's just a, a good guy. Everybody I've ever known who came across Sammy Ball loved him. Well, uh, it's, he was his own guy. It, it seems like, I, my, from my external observation, it seems like Sammy Ball was kind of almost like a player's coach in that they respected him and liked playing with him, but it was this sort of pesky owner that kind of get, kept getting in the way. He was. Bob did not have the discipline to be a real good coach. Yeah, you know, he'd be drawing plays up in the dirt. You know, I don't think they, they don't think they had a playbook at all. Bob would just sort of wing it down on the sideline. And you look at coaches like Vince Lombardi and uh, Hank Stram and the coaches that year they were very successful. John Shula, they were very structured, disciplined people. Bob was not. After the season was over, he went back to the ranch. He just he showed up for practice. He showed up for games, and that was about it. He wasn't there uh, looking at film till three in the morning like some of these coaches are. He uh, he wasn't all excited about being a coach, and he told me when he interviewed, he said, "I don't know why I let him talk me into going to New York. I didn't want to go to New York. I didn't like New York. I didn't like the polo grounds." But you know, basically, Wismer was very persuasive, offered him a lot of money, and he accepted. And he he regretted it. He was as happy to get out of uh, New York as Wismer was to get him out of New York. Well, when, uh, it's interesting, and we'll go back in a second. But I, it, it's interesting when he left, Bob, he, he was replaced by another. Guy Clyde Bulldog Turner, uh, who had no head coaching experience whatsoever going into it, so that seems kind of odd. Why he picked Bulldog Turner, I don't know. I think it was just because Bulldog was a great player, and the idea in those days was if somebody was a good player, they'd probably be a good coach. Bulldog didn't have the respect of the players, they thought he was a good guy. And Bulldog, by the time I was doing the book, was not in good health, was not able to do an interview. I think I spoke with one of his daughters, and uh. He was not able to do it, but the players basically liked him. They felt sorry for him. He was way over his head. He just wasn't an NFL coach. That was the only time he coached. He was, he was, he was a good old boy, and he was probably a good assistant coach when the assistant coach was there to be a crony for the coach. But he, he wasn't a head coach. Why Why was Rick chosen? I don't know. The, the guy with the football brains at that time in the Titans organization was George Sauer Sr., uh, George was what more well respected than anyone else uh, in the organization. George knew more football than anyone in the organization. He was better connected than anyone in the organization. I don't think he wanted to be the coach. Very interesting. Well, it's also interesting too that that Ba had a, uh, I guess after his two seasons was fourteen and fourteen, which actually held up to be uh, the best uh, coaching record for the Titans and then Jets until Parcells came around in the nineties. Right. So uh, it's just it's it's an interesting testament to. How Baugh, just despite his uh, approach and maybe Wismer's uh, disdain or distaste for uh, for his coaching, uh, it, it wasn't a bad start for a team that uh, seemed to have not a whole lot going for it in its early years. Oh, they, they played over their heads. I mean, they always uh, criticized coaches and quarterbacks who were 500. It always reminds me of Fran Tarkenton was in New York. You, maybe a little before your time, but um, 
Families criticized uh, Fran Tarkin to be a 500 quarterback with the Giants. And they said, I think the joke was something like, if, uh, you know, if God was the general manager, Vince Lombardi was a coach, and Fran Tarkin was the quarterback, the Giants would be seven and seven. But after Tarkin didn't left, they found out that you know, seven and seven was the best they were. Uh, they were, you know, three and 11 and four and 12. And so, uh, you know, he, he did a lot without much. And Bob did the same thing. They had a, they had a great offense. They could score. But a lot of the AFL teams were like that. They could score, but they couldn't stop anybody. You know, Don Maynard told me it seemed like when he had, when he had the other team third and 18, they always made the first down. They were, they, they'd win like 38, 35 and lose 42 to 49. I mean, they really, in, that, in those days, football was not as high scoring as it is now. There was not as much passing, uh, although the AFL passed a lot more. They wanted to be entertaining. They had a ball that was a little easier to throw. Sure. But there were a lot of high scoring games. The, the Titans had a very bad defense. Well, uh, before we get into uh, the the first uh, season or two, I, um, I, I actually want to back up because you, you, obviously we, we keep coming back to to Harry Wismer. Um, uh, did you get into how the name of the the name Titans was chosen? I think there's a little interesting story behind that. If there is, I don't remember. I don't remember writing about it. I think Titan. They said Titans. Well, one of the, one of the the stories. I don't know if it's true or not. Is that the scoreboard said Giants, and they only had to change, you know, to add a T or something to the Titans uh, to get to get their add to T to get Titans out of Giants, and they could reuse the numbers. I've heard that. I don't know if that's true. And I, I just heard Wisner said Titans were better in Greek mythology. Titans were better than Giants, and he was most really competing against the Giants. That was his big thing. He wanted to do the Giants, and it was uh, you know clearly David and Goliath, and and David didn't win that one. Yeah, no, I, I think that's it. And uh, we, by the way, we we were more than happy to skate into the apocryphal uh, if need be here on this podcast. But uh, <laughs> but I, I had that's seen always more, that was more interesting than truth. Uh, sure, of course. Hey, we're, we're, we're in the era of fake news. Why not? There you go. So I, I had I had seen a quote somewhere that indeed this idea of bigger and stronger than the Giants was sort of the uh, was sort of the uh, hy- hyperbolic way to sort of uh, uh, launch a team that uh, obviously was uh, coming into the midst of a very powerful and well-known franchise in the Giants. So it, uh, it stands to reason that what you just said made sense. Um, and they're, and the, uh, Giants, the, Giants, the Giants players got along well with the, the Titans players. They'd socialize, they'd go to P.J. Clarks, and, and most of them were very positive about the new league. Uh, they didn't, the players didn't, you know, resent the Titans coming in. Uh, they said the only one who was kind of dismissive was Sam Huff. They go to a banquet and Sam Huff would say something like, uh, I'm, I'm glad they got a league that I can, I can play in after I, you know, I'm not good enough for the NFL or a player. I can be like Al Toro and, you know, after I'm washed up, I can play in that league or something like that. And, and, you know, the rest of the players, you know, Frank Gifford and uh, Andy Robustelli and players like that, they were very supportive. A lot of them were, a lot of them were friends. There's a lot of Titans that played for the Giants. Uh, they've never been in camp with the Giants and the Cubs, so they, they knew each other. Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seat Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible, the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you could think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose, as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The Ten Gallon War by John Eisenberg. That's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue uh, that could be interesting to our audience here is called The National Forgotten League by Dan Daly. Entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from, and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to and Audible's got it. By the way, two, uh, two guests perhaps that we'll have on the show, hopefully sometime soon. But again, Go to audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free 30-day trial as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash good seats. And now back to our conversation. We 
we look at 1960, right, the inaugural season, you got everything sort of un- uh, underway. There's at least a place to play. You got Bob Murphy behind the uh, behind the microphone of uh, well-known yeah. Mets fans later in years. Um, but it didn't seem like this 1960. It almost seemed like it was pretty, pretty evident pretty early on that uh, this team was uh, not long for its uh, its uh, its uh, its launch and uh, and, and future. Um, I mean, you want to talk about that first game and the first ever preseason game? It seems like that was a uh, a good example of what was to come. Well, the first preseason game, uh, Paul Lowe was back returning the kickoff for the Los Angeles Chargers. He'd been in the mail room. He'd been cut. He took the kickoff, opening kickoff, uh, five yards deep in the end zone, ran 105 yards for a touchdown. And Roger Ellis, who was on the kickoff team, said he's turning the next guy next to him and said it's going to be a long season. And, and Roger's one of those guys. I, I stay friends with Roger. There are only a couple I kept in touch with after after I did the book. And Roger was one of them. He passed away maybe five or six years ago. But I stayed in touch with him. Uh, all. Never, we never met. We, we talked on the phone fairly regularly. We communicated. He and my wife were both dog lovers. Got to know him very well. Uh, he went and worked for the, uh, the Secret Service for a long time after that. And we're, we're digressing now. But um, he was on the detail that guarded Spiro Agnew. And he um, stayed in touch with Agnew. Uh, which was very interesting. Once in a while, they sent me a letter, a copy of a letter that Agnew had sent him. And you think of Agnew as a guy who resigned in disgrace from the vice presidency. He's writing these chatty letters about his grandchildren and his kid, grown children then. And how have you been, Roger? Remember the good old days, blah, blah, blah. And, and Roger had nothing but good things to say about Agnew. He said as, as a boss in the Secret Service, he was fantastic. You know, we're very considerate of everyone. So that's a digression from Paul Lowe running the kickoff back. But they they lost that exhibition. They lost almost every exhibition. They may have lost them all. I don't remember. But the opening game was played in the wake of a hurricane. So the crowd was terrible. They were at the polo grounds. It was muddy. There was nobody there. And uh, they lost that game to Buffalo. They had a good quarterback. And they had good offense. Al Doro, who had, had some NFL experience, a lot of experience in Canada. They had Maynard, who turned out to be just a gem. Powell, who showed up just before the season started. Didn't have much in the way of running backs. Didn't have a defense. So they were seven and seven, but they just they weren't drawing at all. New York, the Polo Grounds was a terrible place. They were competing with the Giants. They were competing with the Giants on television. And the weather for the first couple of years, they they called it. Uh, when the weather was good, they just called it Marrow weather because the Giants always seemed to get great weather when they needed it, even if it was December. And then Dick Young, I think, wrote something about Wismer weather, which is a hurricane, a blizzard. Now, they seem to be clear. You only have seven home games, and it would seem like three or four would have, you know, rainstorms or bitter cold or something. But they, they never, they never drew. And by the third year, and I don't know if we're jumping ahead a little bit here, but they, they were just out of money. Wismer had no money. He had to, had to sell some other stock he had. Before the season to get enough money to start the season, he stiffed uh, the people of East Stroudsburg State for training camp expenses. Uh, the check started bouncing early in the season, and and he lost. I forget the numbers. I think they lost was it a million dollars in the first two years, maybe. But he lost a lot of money. He didn't have a lot of money, so it it they weren't that bad on the field. They were better than the Raiders. They were better than some other teams that survived, but they just didn't have the money. They didn't have that deep pocket. That they, they that any startup team needs to survive. You know the story again. The apocryphal. Lamar Hunt. Uh, somebody said. Or somebody said they tell Hunt his father. Oh, that damn fool son of yours is going to lose a million dollars on that football team this year. And he said, Well, I guess reckon at that rate, in another fifty years he'll be broke. Yeah, Wismer didn't have fifty years of losing a million dollars a year. He, he couldn't. He made about one. And that was it. When he uh, and before the '62 season, he married uh, the widow of Longies Wilton, who was a New Jersey uh, organized crime figure who died. Up, he hung himself in his basement, and his his um, uh, widow Mary ended up marrying Harry Wesmer, and she had a lot of money. And the, the hope was that she would somehow bring that money to save the Titans, but uh, she was smarter than that, and she kept her money in the seclusion and let Harry. Uh, sink on his own that's that's really interesting well i, I mean it, it doesn't seem like the uh the the new york metropolitan area took to the team either i mean regardless of you know some of the misfortunes in terms of weather and whatnot i mean it seems like that uh, uh they proverbially stayed away in droves and i'm just wondering 
perhaps why that was, why they weren't able to break, uh, you know, through to say the the Giants crowd as an alternative, or uh, it's clear that, uh, that that the relationship with the Mets didn't help uh, when they were uh, 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 awarded by the uh, National League and then also placed in the Polo Grounds for a short period of time. Uh, it, it, it seems like they uh, the Titans got the short end of the stick when it came to scheduling uh, in that second season, even. That was their their final season, their third season, uh, when the Mets were in because the Mets didn't move in until '62. That's correct. I'm and sorry. they got some bad scheduling, and that, I think at that time it was a it was a lost cause. Uh, the Polo Grounds is a very bad place, and if you look at the Mets, people say the Mets they were unbelievable. The fan support was incredible. They drew I think 922,000 their first year, and just over a million the second year, which for a last place team and a horrible last place team was amazing. But if you look at the crowd. They, were, they came to see the Giants and the Dodgers. They came when the Giants and the Dodgers came into town, they'd get 50,000, 45,000. When the Colts, 45, and the Cubs came in, they got three, 4,000. If it wasn't for the Giants and Dodgers coming back and coming into town, the Mets wouldn't have drawn very well. Then the Mets had Casey Stengel, they had uh, Gil Hodges, they had Richie Ashburn, they had Frank Thomas, they had Roger Craig, all the old favorites. But when the Giants and Dodgers went in, they weren't drawing very well. You know, so you you, uh, you know everyone tends to think that the Mets were a great success. Uh, the, the Titans were terrible, but the Titans didn't have any any team coming back to uh, to draw. You know, it's the Giants and Dodgers, the old favorites of the area, that really drew the crowds for the Mets those first few years. It wasn't until the mid '60s, late '60s, that the Mets started to really attract crowds on their own. So it's a, it's a tough go. And they say the Polo Grounds was a very bad place. Just you know, that there was crime in the area, parking was bad. Uh, everything was bad about it. And you look at the other teams, and the other teams did not do well either. Uh, Los Angeles ended up moving to San Diego after a year. Dallas wound up moving to Kansas City after three years. Uh, Boston struggled for years with Billy Sullivan. They moved from one stadium to another. They were in Harvard. They were in Fenway Park. They were in Boston University. None of the teams did terribly well. Just the other teams had more money. They were able to last. last. Uh, Buffalo, you know, Buffalo did better than most, which seems to belly everything I said because War Memorial Stadium was an absolute pit. But uh, none of the teams did terribly well. Uh, and, you know, New York had a big market, but they were competing with the Giants and they had a terrible facility. At what point do you think Hunt and uh, and the owners of the uh, AFL kind of started to really worry about the New York franchise? How early on in their lives did you did you, did you well, sense it, that they, uh, things were not going great? Well, probably the first time they met Wismer, they probably wanted, must have worried about it because he was an eccentric character. Huh. Uh, when they were having the formation of the NFL or AFL, he did some strange things. But clearly the financial wheels came off in the beginning of the 62 season. Uh, checks started bouncing. The league wound up taking over the payroll by midseason and assessing all the te- other teams to, to make the payroll. And certainly by early season 1962, they knew Wismer was a goner. They, they were trying to sell the team. Wismer was holding out for big bucks. Um, that last season, they knew it was going to be his last season. There was no way he was going to be. He, he was hoping to get to Shea Stadium or whatever they're going to call the stadium there. That was his salvation. Uh, he was not going to make it. Uh, they didn't get there until 64, so even if he lasted another season, it wouldn't have made it anyway. But uh, by the by, the beginning of the '62 season, I think his uh, his fate was uh, sealed. And by and by the by November of '62, the league uh, itself finally came in and took over for Wismer. Did, was that done at, at Wismer's request, or was that kind of just the the league basically saying time to park it and uh, we'll take over from here? Or do you have any insight as to the dynamics of how that actually uh, and finally occurred? I believe it was the, the league. I, I don't think Wismer requested it. Wismer, until the very end, thought he was going to make it. Um, I had a copy of a letter. It was after the season, after the 62 season, to the, the season ticket holder saying, we're coming back in 63. It's going to be a great year, as if nothing had happened. Uh, he was in bank. I think he was in bankruptcy at the time. But he was he was one of those manic people who just thought that he was completely detached from reality. He, he never thought he was going under. He only thought some miracle was going to save him at the end and, you know, he would, he would survive. And he was one of those guys who just thought he was somehow special and blessed and it would all work out for him in the end. No matter how dark things were, he only thought things were, were, uh, kind of come together that he sees some, occasionally there'll be some scene where somebody reported seeing him down, 
you know, just sitting on the team bus with his head down, thinking, you know, the jig's up, it's, uh, it's all over for me. But most of the time, he was just acting like nothing was wrong. Yeah, we're we're going we're gonna to go get him 63. Uh, what he, uh, my understanding is that uh, he tried to circumvent maybe the league selling the team by declaring bankruptcy, either for the team or for himself. Was that sort of part of the mix? It sounds like it was a wrinkle near the end of how to how to dispose of the yeah, he team. Put the, he put the team in. I don't believe he had filed himself, and that was he was trying to. He was fighting the sale. Yeah, the, the league wanted Sonny Werblin in, and the negotiations went on for quite some time. And I'm, I'm hazy on the details now, but he did fight it. Uh, he put the team in bankruptcy. Which stalls anything, of course, and uh, but but there was no way out. Warbon finally, he, I think there were negotiations between him and Warbon, and Warbon finally ended up taking over the team, and I think Wismer got something. Well, so uh, what then became uh, the New York Jets? Obviously, it was almost like a rebirth of the franchise, right? I mean, uh, new name, new ownership, and uh, it just seems like it was a whole new, complete lease on life. And that was the intention to get rid of the Titans image, they, the, changing the name. You're from Titans, who are you know, mythology, to Jets, Space Age. Uh, change the team colors. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't change the players. They had mostly the same players. But they did change a lot of players. They changed the coach. They brought in Lee Bubank. And, uh, the whole, and then they had one more season in the polo grounds. But that was just treading water until they got to Shea Stadium. And once they got to Shea Stadium, things changed completely. The opening night, they had a big crowd. Always had big crowds. Uh, there were Jack Klotz. There was Sammy Baugh. I remember both of them. Sammy Baugh told me that um, he was coaching the Oilers in 64. And they, they came into Shea Stadium to play the Jets. And Wismer, he asked Wismer, um, or Wismer asked him if he could ride to the stadium on the Oilers bus, and he said yes. Because Baugh was one of those guys who did not hold a grudge. Wismer had treated him miserably, but... He was kind of guy. Sure, Sam, you know, sure, Harry. You know, you can ride the bus with us. And took him the same. And he said he, he went up to the press box. He came down. Somebody, somebody beaten him up. His eye was black. Whether he'd been hit or whether he fell in a drunken stupor or something, uh, don't know. And he said he. I said I felt really bad for the guy. His nose, his nose was bleeding. And he came back down. Something had happened to him up in the press box. And he said I just saw him from it looking out. And it was him or Jack Klotz told me that. Jack was with the Oilers, man. And he said, I saw him looking out at the whole, the big crowd at Shea Stadium, and he had to be thinking, this could all have been mine. You know, if they, I had just held on another year, another two years, this could all have been mine. And of course, Wismer died not too long after that. He was very bitter. He wrote a book called, uh, it was, they call it Sport. And he was very critical of just about everybody he dealt with. Uh, but, you know, he, he just, that was the one time when, when Sort of a humanist came through that, you know, tears in his eyes, looking at this magnificent crowd at Shea Stadium, the new uniforms, the field, everything, and thinking, oh, I almost made it. I almost made it. Yeah, that's um, that's pretty poignant, and uh, and you wonder if some of the dynamics had been a little different. I mean, obviously the uh, his money situation probably would not have changed, but you wonder if it had been a couple of years later, say, when the AFL got set up or, or Flushing Stadium had actually uh, been built or, or been agreed to been built uh, even a year earlier than, uh, than its uh, 1964 launch. Um, you wonder if things could have been a little bit different. But, um, you know, I guess that's why we sort of will go back. I, I, I'm really curious, is, is there any other sort of lasting legacy, uh, if anything, besides these memories about the, the Titans' uh, first couple of years? I mean, is there anything that the, Jet, the Jets – sort of built upon or, or was it largely a forgotten chapter that people want to forget? It seems like the Jets kind of trying to whitewash much of it uh, as the years went on. Uh, you see very little of it. There's a highlight film of the Jets. I went to the Jets uh, headquarters to do research and spent some time there. And people were really wonderful to me, but I was sitting in the waiting room and they've got pictures all over the wall. Almost every picture is from 1968. <laughs> that is the highlight. They had not many Titan stuff. And I got so much Titan stuff because nobody knew what it was where it was, got all the play-by-plays, all these boxes of stuff in there. And, uh, you know, it's really wonderful stuff. But they, they don't acknowledge Titans. They were very generous to me. Um, and But nobody knew anything. I got invited to the uh, Jets reunions. And you know, I got to know some of these players. And Jack Klotz, uh, Roger Ellis never went. But, you know, several of the players I got to know reasonably well. 
Hayseed Stevens. I did an article on Hayseed Stevens for the, the uh, Coffin Corner, which is the Professional Football Research Association uh, newsletter. Sure. And, and he was he was an amazing character. And if you you can get it online, he played briefly for the Titans, but he wound up getting becoming an evangelist and an oil man. He was in one of running a financial scam. He was trying to re- recruit me to invest money in his oil wells. He was trying to drill for oil in Israel. He was one of those larger than life characters. <laughs> I remember having dinner with him once in New York. I was down there on business and we got together. He was happened to be in town. Always had a big cowboy hat, the big boots, the big belt buckle. And he could talk an unbelievable game. He was one of those characters. He just, he had been an al- a raging alcoholic who stopped, became an evangelist, uh, was covenant brother with the king of the Zulus. Uh, and I said, you know, who, from who else can you get one degree of separation from the, the covenant to the king of the Zulus? Uh, so, you know, he, he was just a remarkable guy to know. It was most of the players, you know, the legacy. And I was uh, contracted to write a couple of articles for it was a Super Bowl magazine that was going to be put out, a big glossy magazine, which got killed. Uh, and a, and a kill fee and no article. But it was on the Titans who had played in the Super Bowl. Uh Don Maynard, Curly Johnson, Bill Mathis, and Larry Grantham. And those four players were in a lot of ways the legacy of the Titans. Maynard especially. Uh, just a, a very he wrote the forward for my book. Interesting man. I interviewed him two or three times. Grantham and other thing. Interesting people. Went on to coach, uh, went on to broadcast. Uh Curly Johnson has since passed away, another character. Uh, one of the stories about him was in training camp. Well, that's how I started out my book in the 62 training camp. Uh, Johnson got an advance on his salary, $1,500 to check bomb. And he kept trying to get the check made good. And rather than make the check good, they were planning to cut him just to save the $1,500. So the players are out drinking the night before. I said, that, that's really unfair. We got to do something about it. So. They went out, they decided to just let Curly be a star. They had a scrimmage the next day. So every time he got the ball, people would fall off him. They'd uh, play dead. He gained a phenomenal amount of yards in the scrimmage. It looked like the second coming of Red Grange. And they couldn't cut him. So they saved him. And he wound up being there for the Super Bowl. Uh, some of these guys, Grantham. Grantham was a typical story. He was undersized, ignored by the NFL. It drafted in some late round by the Baltimore Colts. And he was too small, 190 pounds, played linebacker. But he made it in the AFL because they were looking for players like that. And so many of those early AFL players were the rejects. And I wrote about a lot about them. And that's what the early AFL was to me. These guys who were shut out by the NFL, first of all, the owners, second of all, the coaches, third of all, the players. They were playing in minor leagues. They were playing in Canada. They were playing in service ball. And there was something wrong with them. They were too small. They were a step too slow. They were too short. Something was wrong with them, but they had the ability to play, and they got that opportunity to play in the AFL. And then there were so many players. Uh, look at the early ones. Gino Capaletti, another classic. Charlie Hennigan. Charlie Hennigan was a guy for the Oilers who wound up catching over 100 passes one year. He was uh, uh, cut in Canada. He was cut in uh, the U.S., and he said uh, he had to end up with a Ph.D. in education. So they told me I couldn't block, and I was too dumb to learn the play. Said, One of those is true. Uh, and, and he got a chance. These guys getting a chance who never would have gotten a chance. I think that's the legacy of the early AFL is these guys who could not play in the NFL but had the ability but didn't fit the mold got a chance to express themselves. Yeah, it was also a, it's also a challenger, right? I mean, there's something uh, it's just like, like being an entrepreneur in, in many respects in today's modern world, right? I mean, you're doing something that's different. It's bolder. It's brash, more brash. It's, uh, you know, like you mentioned before, some of the uh, the offensive approaches, some of the rules changes. You know, it was a bit, uh, a little different, and he had to be different, right? Because you're trying to challenge the establishment. Uh, but it seems like uh, those, those characters would fit in very well into that kind of uh, that kind of culture, no? You know, Lee Grosskopf is another one. I, Lee also played minor league football in Connecticut, so I had to be him twice. And he's another guy I've got to know. He's a wonderful man, just the nicest guy. And you know, I've talked to people who worked with him in television and said the same thing. Just a very delightful down there, a likable man, and he was did not fit in with the Giants because he was an intellectual. He would uh, he was interested. In, he was a writer. Of course, he wrote a diary of the '62 season called Fourth and One. He'd done some writing with the Giants, and he wrote uh, a series on uh, for Sports Illustrated, and it was very emotional. He talked about how he felt, and in those days, football players didn't talk about how they felt. They just hit people. It was unmanly. So he got abused in the NFL. Uh, he was not treated well. 
end up being waived out of the league. Went with the, the Titans and, and got hurt. He did not have a great career with the Titans, but he had some moments of glory. And he said how much he enjoyed playing the AFL because it was different. Now, all these rebels were over here, all the anti-establishment, uh, anti-NFL types. And he said when the merger happened, I thought we'd lost something. We merged with the NFL in well, 66 and then effective in 70. So they, they lost the character of the AFL. And a lot of the old AFL fans, a lot of the old AFL players, regret the merger. Uh, they think that the AFL had its own personality, had its own uh, joie de vivre, and that kind of went away. And the NFL was just much more corporate. And, and it was in the 50s and 60s as well. Pete Rozelle, I, in, in my opinion, again, another digression, was one of the greatest commissioners of any sport at any time. You look at what he did with the NFL. But he was, he was a corporate Madison Avenue guy. He was not the, the freewheeling AFL type. Uh, he picked up on the good things the AFL did, and he wound up orchestrating a merger and took them over. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, the template, obviously, for today's modern day NFL and, frankly, professional sports, I think, too, uh, when uh, all is said and done. When you were um, when you were doing research, did you um, were you able to discover any uh, audio or uh, or video or telecasts? Uh, did you get a chance, for ex- for example, to talk to uh, uh, to Bob Murphy, uh, who was still around, I guess, when you were writing the book, uh, maybe about his broadcast experiences at all? I did not, and I did not. Find, I have a lot of audio of old football games, old baseball games. I, I do not have any. I don't know there's any tape of the Titans. The guy I inquired was not able to come across any. You see, there's a, some highlight films. Uh, as an, another aside, when my uh, when I get to advice of these Jets reunions and a couple of the exhibition games, I somehow got on their mailing list as a former Jet player. So I started getting these letters offering me tickets and asking me to make appearances on behalf of the Jets. No, and one of the things they sent me was this, this DVD of the history of the Jets. In the first, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes is about the Titans. I mean, there are tape clips. But, you know, in those days, they often recorded over stuff. You know, they didn't keep masters like they do now. And that's, you know, the 1960 World Series game seven just reappeared. Bing Crosby had filmed it. But they'd film the game and just tape over it for the next show. They can't put game six or game seven over it. So I, I did not come across any audio, any video, and did not co- talk to Bob Murphy. Now I talked to a couple of reporters who covered them. For non-players, I talked to Bill Wallace of the New York Times, Gordon White, who wrote for the New York Times, I talked to Dr. Nicholas, who was a team physician. I don't think we got any other uh, front office types. That was about it. Most, mostly it was player interviews, and then some opponent players, like Gino Capaletti, Charlie Hannigan, uh, a couple of other opponents whose names escape me right now but the, you know some of the bigger players are quite against try to get billy cannon but he did not it was not cooperative well we will put it out there to our listeners you'd be surprised even just 20 episodes in the uh the the level of fandom and uh and minutiae that uh, our, our our listeners get into i'm reminded of um yeah and one of those pieces of minutiae maybe this is sort of a, an interesting segue to our to uh to you know our, uh, uh, ending our conversation at some point soon um you know, I talk about television and, and that kind of stuff. There was uh, an interesting incident in that first year uh, that was uh, a scary, uh, um, I don't know, almost uh, a prescient uh, uh, event uh, that uh, presaged the uh, Heidi game later in the, in the uh, AFL AFC's uh, existence, uh, where there was a game that was cut off near the end locally. Uh, do you, you, yeah, any- when you when you started talking? I knew you were going to get to that point. It was against uh, the Dallas Texans. It was uh, one of those back and forth games that ran long, a lot of action, and with a couple of minutes to go, and it was a game where they had three perilous finishes at the end. One game, the Titans lost when their punter dropped a snap from center on the last play. The next day, they, they, next week, they blocked a punt and ran it in at the end. And the third day, it was the same thing. It was a fumble right near the goal line and. ABC had cut it, cut it off uh, with a couple minutes to go. They went to, I think it was a Davy Crockett special or something, or some some special. They'd cut it off and didn't learn their lesson, apparently, because they did it again in 1968 in the famous Heidi game. Uh, they cut the uh, Raiders and the, and the Jets off. Yeah, they, not too many people noticed. There are probably some people who were glad the Titans game was cut off. They'd rather see Davy Crockett. <laughs> no, that's a sad statement, isn't it? That's just terrible. Uh, so um so i in our remaining moments i, I do appreciate uh all this uh, this background this is pretty interesting i you know it's just it's just really interesting to sort of see how uh how current teams either do or do not embrace their past 
Uh, I can't imagine, maybe you know this uh, better than I, if the Jets have ever even remembered the Titans, so to speak, uh, in a throwback game or, a, you know, a blue and gold jersey of any sort, or is it, you know, they pretty much look one way and uh, and not remember at all. I mean, they're clearly other teams, right, uh, that we've had some conversations like the Steagles, you know, that combination of the Steelers and the and the uh, and the Eagles. You know, there was a throwback game that the uh, the Steelers had a number of years ago. But I don't sense that the Jets have any uh, fond memories or uh, any, uh, uh, you know, remembrances on field or off of the Titans, huh? They, they definitely did a throwback game with the Titans uniforms. I know that. Oh, they did? Okay. Uh, I, I don't remember when, but I do remember seeing it because anybody who knows me, you know I wrote a book, said, make sure you tune in or did you see it? And, and I did see it. Yeah, they, they do not embrace the history of the Titans. They're like the embarrassing drunk uncle that everybody tries to push in the background. Uh, you know, this happened, but, uh, and I'll talk about it. And it's almost like, uh, the National Association of Baseball. You know, the first, the first league, but if you read any history of baseball, they dismiss it. And that's why I wrote about it. They'll dismiss it in a sentence or two. There was this terrible thing called the National Association that was around for five years, but, and baseball really started when the National League started in 1876. That's why I wrote about it. And it's very, very uh, much a parallel playing to the Titans. You know, football didn't start. Uh, professional football, or the Jets didn't start in 63. There was a team that started before that. And it was very interesting. I mean, just the trying to survive and the player stories. And and it had it was balanced. And what I tried to do is present a balanced, balanced episode. When I talked to Roger Ellis the first time. He said he became a good friend. He said, if you're just going to make fun of us, I'm not going to help you. But I want to present a, a balanced look. And I, I think I think I did that because uh, the players, one of the things that I always, one of the best compliments you can get is somebody who was there saying, you got it right. And, and a couple of the players afterwards said, you, you really got it right. That's the way it was. And that's what I was trying to do. I was not trying to take one side or another side. Say it was embarrassing. It was horrible. There were good things that happened. There were bad things that happened. And try to present a, a really a, a good look at what the team was actually all about, for better and for worse. Well, the book we've been referencing is called Crash of the Titans, the team that became the New York Jets. It uh, came out in 2000, uh, published by Total Sports. Is it still available? Is it in print? Or is it kind of one of those things you got to find out of print on Amazon, et cetera? Oh, you can find it. It, it, it actually did a paperback in 2000 and something, maybe 12. No, it was before 2008, I think. Uh, McFarland. You can get on the McFarland website, McFarlandPub.com, and you look McFarland Publishers. Fantastic. So it's available. It's, I think it's available on ebook. It's available certainly as a, as a paperback. Uh, get it on Amazon. You can find it on Amazon. It, it's, it's available. I apologize for that that uh, that omission because uh, I uh, just did a, another search on Amazon and the uh, the old pay, the old uh, hardcover uh, copy came out. But uh, indeed, our friends at McFarland. Uh, whom we've had a lot of uh, uh, authors on of late. Uh, indeed, that's uh, that's great to know that the, it was reissued. It is available uh, in paperback uh, wherever fine books are found. And um, I encourage you to to read it. It's it's a fun it's a fun read. I think you know. Obviously, if you uh, a New York Jets fan or you call yourself a New York Jets fan and and uh, you don't at least have some understanding of the uh, first few years, not only of the AFL but the team in New York that preceded the Jets. I think it's uh, well worth your time to. Uh, to delve into it, uh, despite the fact that there doesn't seem to be any uh, video or audio uh, 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 examples of the team's existence. But, uh, uh, Bill, I can't thank you enough for uh, for spending some time and and recounting some of these uh, these stories. What else do you have uh, coming up or uh, maybe other leagues or teams or whatever that uh, you may want to uh, tackle? No pun, uh, you know, uh, c- going forward. Well, I've got a couple things I'm working on. It. One is uh, said coming out soon. I'm waiting for the proofs any day. Baseball on the Brink, the Crisis of 1968. And then I'm working on a book on the 1884 baseball season, which is pretty well along. And then I'm doing something, non my first non-sports book. I said, before I die, I want to publish something that's not sports-related, just to see if I can. And we're all doing all this research in microfilm for years and years, spending 35 years in life, 36 years in libraries. I'd see something that just caught my eye, not related to what I was doing, but I'd just print it out, print out the page. You have these unusual stories from the 1960s and early 70s, some just very strange, uh, some that show how the United States was changing during the 1960s with their hair, clothes, the perception of women, uh, hippies, things like that. 
and stringing these together to take the articles, not reprinting the articles, but writing about the articles and then doing some research on them. In other words, here's, here's something that happened in the 60s. It's very strange. Now, what happened to these people? You know, here's an odd marital arrangement where, you know, five people married together. You know, can I find out what happened to these people 20 years later? Did they stay married? Did they get married to other people? And I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I, I, I talked to McFarland and I, I think they're interested. Uh, I've been writing a lot about that and that's what I was working on before, before we uh, got on the phone tonight. And, um, uh, that's it. I also have an idea, which I've started researching generally for sports in the sixties in general and how they've changed from Olympics to baseball, football, basketball, some kind of racial problems, the labor problems, all those things. You know, a fairly serious book on that, and and that's that's what I'm working on. In addition to you know articles, I write for the National Pastime Museum on a semi-regular basis, and uh, yeah, that's what I'm that's what I'm working on. That's great. Well, I, I think at the very least, we should probably try to figure out some time to have you back to talk about the National Association. That would certainly qualify into our uh, teams and leagues that don't exist anymore. And obviously, it's a very interesting prelude to uh, the uh, the National and then American leagues that came thereafter. Um, and I wish oh, you as, as, as existed for almost 150 years. It's right up your alley. <laughs> yeah, it's timely, right? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> but thank you. So I, we appreciate you being dragged back to your uh, your memories of the uh, the team that used to be uh, the predecessor of the New York Jets. And this has been great. I appreciate your time very much. This is awesome. Well, Tim, thank you very much. I've enjoyed doing it, and I appreciate you having me on. Okay, there it is, our conversation with uh, Bill Reisick, who we uh, thank tremendously for joining us. Uh, the book uh, we're referencing is called Crash of the Titans, the team that became the New York Jets. And I just want to make sure that everybody is aware that, uh, uh, unlike what I was uh, describing in our discussion, uh, that book is indeed available uh, today in paperback form uh, from McFarland. Uh, it came out as a reissue in 2009 from the original uh, hardcover edition nine years earlier. Uh, that's probably available too. That hardcover edition, uh, in uh, you know, on eBay or or as a resale somewhere. But the paperback edition from McFarland is indeed out. It's got a great cover on it. It's got a nice forward there from uh, former Jet and Titan player Don Maynard, uh, and it's a, it's a great read. And uh, I, I, you know, you got a taste of some of those stories. And again, if you caught you call yourself a New York Jets fan, uh, you uh, you do owe it to yourself to understand. Uh, the three years or so of AFL goodness, or maybe not so goodness, or at least interestingness, if that's a word, uh, that came before uh, your beloved Jets came into official being uh, in 1963 or so. Um, again, Crash of the Titans, the team that became the New York Jets. It's by our guest, Bill Reisick, and I highly encourage you to uh, get a copy uh, wherever fine books are found, including, by the way, you'll find a link to uh, to the book, on our great website, of course, goodseatsstillavailable.com. Uh, that's where you'll find everything about this show. Uh, if you want to sign up for our email newsletter, which someday we promise we actually will start publishing, uh, you can send us some email with a request or some commentary about some shows or some stuff that you liked or didn't like. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff uh, about uh, all, any old episodes. They're all there for you. Uh, you can also, of course, follow us on uh, various forms of social media. If you go on, on Twitter, it's uh, Good Seats Still. That's at Good Seats Still. Uh, you'll find us on Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, you will also find us on Facebook. We have a page uh, dedicated to the show there. Uh, on and on and on. The uh, the, uh, the the social media uh, love is uh, is palpable, and we we uh, can't thank you enough for uh, for engaging us uh, in conversation and uh, and for letting your friends know about this little podcast. Uh, also, before we run, I do want to say thank you, uh, and I don't say it enough, uh, to uh, the fine folks down in uh, Alabama at Podfly Productions, uh, who uh, put this show together and helped make it sound uh, as professional as possible, uh, despite my efforts to make it less than that. Uh, Corey Coates, Jerry Payne, David Gregerson, Eric Begay, uh, the entire crew at Podfly Productions. Uh, if you need some podcasting production expertise, I highly recommend them. Uh, you can find them at podfly.net. That's podfly, P-O-D-F-L-Y dot net. Uh, and tell them that uh, Tim Hanlon and Good Seats Still Available sent you. And uh, I, I guarantee that you will find them to be of high quality as uh, as I have found them. Um, okay, that's enough babbling. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you on our next episode. Take care, everybody. Take care, everybody.